Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning as we gather around God's Word and God's sacrament as we continue through this Advent season preparing the coming of Jesus. Uh, this morning we're going to focus on our Old Testament reading, which comes to us from Isaiah chapter 40, where God calls out that we calls out the prophet, comfort, comfort these my people. And uh, how does that message apply to us today? We begin by singing our opening hymn, hymn 346, When All the World Was Cursed. our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who makes heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive the Jesus of our sins. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I am poor and merciful sinner. Confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, which, which I have never offended you, and justly deserve your 
temporal and eternal punishment. But I have hardly sorrowed in them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine in your face. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who led Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. You brought a vine out of Egypt. It took a new root and filled the land. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that you may see the day. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Restore us, O God. Son, that by his coming we may be enabled to serve you with pure minds, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading for the second Sunday in Advent comes to us from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, the first 11 verses. And our text begins with God's command to the prophet Isaiah that he should proclaim comfort to his people. The prophet is to be a voice calling for straight paths, for mountains to be brought low, and valleys to be lifted up. We read, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass wither, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arms rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading comes to us from Peter's second letter, chapter 3, verses 8 through 14. And our epistle reading reminds us that the Lord is not slow as we think of slow. He is patient, wanting to save everyone. But while we wait for the day of the Lord to come, 
We are to live holy and godly lives. Peter writes, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that, the, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish, and at peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we continue with the Alleluia verse. <clears throat> is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It begins with John the Baptist as the voice in the wilderness crying out a message of repentance. But John's message was to point to the true Savior, Jesus. We read. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now continue by confessing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with our next hymn, Hymn 344, on Jordan's Bank, the Baptist Bride. Please be seated. <laughs>
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What would you say to someone to comfort them in their time of need? For example, when a child is convinced there's a monster under the bed. What would you say? Nothing? Come on. What would you say to a child that's convinced they have a monster under the bed? What? So you're telling them there is a monster underneath the bed, Kathy? But what would you say to a kid who's convinced there's a monster in the bed? I checked, there's nothing there. Yeah, check, there's nothing there. Let's look, right? Monsters don't exist. I'll check under your bed for you. All right, let's try a different one. Maybe this one will get you guys talking. You find a little boy lost in the supermarket. What would you say to him? It'll be okay? I'll help you find your mom or dad. Yeah, or maybe we can find someone that can help us find your parents. Yes. Well, how about this one? Someone you know just broke up with their boyfriend or girlfriend. What would you say then? Say that nice and loud. There's, more fish in the There's plenty of fish in the sea. Right? What else might you say? Well, that's it. There's plenty of fish in the sea. Yeah. All right. How about it's her loss or his loss, right? Right? He or she doesn't know what she's missing out on. You can do so much better anyways. Or what if your friend is nervous and scared because your friend is having surgery? What would you say then? You'll be okay? I'm praying for you. The Lord will be with you. You have good doctors and nurses. Man, there's a lot of things you can say, but yeah. Jesus will be with you during this procedure. There are a lot of things that you can say in different situations to bring comfort to someone. And our text from Isaiah chapter 40, especially the first half, is no different. God calls out with a very clear command. Comfort, comfort my people. <coughs> and I hope you ask a very fundamental question when you hear those words. Comfort them about what? And by asking that question, we can then dive into Isaiah chapter 40. What's Isaiah supposed to comfort God's people about? And what's interesting is, is this is where I find biblical scholars agree almost across the board about what they should be comforted about. God's people are to be comforted that their exile is ending. Now, to understand this, we need to understand that Isaiah chapter 39 and chapter 40 are very interesting and very, uh, for some people, perplexing chapters of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 39 really ends the first part of Isaiah where, where uh, um, the Assyrian threat is over. God has delivered Jerusalem and King Hezekiah from the Assyrian threat. Now it's a time of rebuilding and restoring peace. But in Isaiah 39, some strangers from some land called Babylon that no one's ever heard of comes by and checks out Jerusalem. And King Hezekiah shows them everything. Shows them the riches of the kingdom. Shows us the riches of the temple. Shows them the, all of Jerusalem. Everything there is to see. These Babylon, Babylonian envoys get a picture of everything. And God then sends Isaiah to King Hezekiah with a message. These strangers aren't going to be strangers soon. They will be back. And everything you show them, they're going to carry away. In 
including the very people of Jerusalem, will be forced out of their homes to live in a foreign land scattered across Babylon, which they haven't even heard of. And King Hezekiah kind of had a sad response. He was glad because it wasn't going to take place during his lifetime. But that's how Isaiah 39 ends. With the promise that Babylon's going to come in and destroy everything and carry everyone away from their homes. Isaiah 40 begins assuming that's already happened. Comfort, comfort these my people. Right? Shout that God is going to bring it into his judgment. Man, a lot of time has happened between Isaiah 39 and Isaiah 40. There's a big gap there. There's decades and centuries apart between these two chapters. And our text is God promising that rebuilding is going to happen. That peace is on the horizon. That they're going to go back home. I mean, what more comforting words could there be to a group of people who have been kicked out of their homes, sent to a strange land for decades, than to hear, it's time to come home. But it's more than just it's time to come home. The mountains will be brought low. The valleys will be lifted up. In other words, all the stuff that you've got on your back that you have to carry home, you don't have to walk up the hill or mountain to get home. Right? All that stuff on your back and you start walking downhill and pretty soon you lose control and you start falling and you roll down all the way to the bottom of the hill with certain broken bones and possibly even death. Not going to happen! Because the valley's going to be lifted up. No tripping, no falling, straight and easy path home. I mean, there's no better words of comfort to people who have been displaced from their homes than to hear, come home, and the trip's going to be as easy as possible. And it's pretty easy to understand this text when you understand this context. But then the New Testament comes in and throws a wrench into this text. I mean, it sounds so easy. It's just comforting words to people in exile. And it all happened. It took place. But then in Mark's Gospel, you hear it, as well as in Matthew and Luke, that the voice crying in the wilderness is John the Baptist. Centuries after this text is seemingly fulfilled, the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit, tells us that this is talking about the voice of John the Baptist. And what do we do with that wrinkle? With that wrench? That maybe there's something more going on in regards to this exile and return home. What if all of this was pointing to something greater? I mean, we know that the Old Testament was constantly pointing to Jesus as the fulfiller of the Old Testament prophecy and the fulfillers of the words of the Old Testament itself. And I wonder if we couldn't do the same thing with our text and with the exile as well. And of course we can. It's really not that hard to make that connection. I mean, technically we're all here because we all believe that we are exiles. That we aren't in our true homes. That we're in a temporary home. That we're away from God. We aren't in the holy city, what we might call the new Jerusalem. We are exiles living in, in a strange and foreign place. As a famous hymn would say, I'm but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. And yet, doesn't that sound strange to us? That we are exiles here? That we don't belong here? that we belong somewhere greater? Because our experiences say the opposite. We work night and day to make our house a home. We feel like we should be allowed to defend our earthly home no matter what might happen around it. Some of you might work overtime and stretch yourself thin so that you can, you can make your mortgage payments or 
paid off so that your home becomes fully yours faster. But everything we experience, everything that we taste and smell, everything we touch belongs to this world. To this world that we call home. And it's very easy for us Christians to get wrapped up in this world, in this home, in the here and now. Even though we hear Isaiah the prophet remind us that all flesh is like grass. And life in this world is like the flower of the field. Beautiful one day, wither and die the next. The truth of the matter is, we are all exiles. We are foreigners and strangers. Which means we need a path back home. We need the valleys lifted up and the hills and mountains brought low. We need a voice calling that says, follow the straight path. Someone greater is coming to lead you to your true home. And of course that person is Jesus. For the New Testament tells us that Jesus has come to lead us on a path to our true home. A home that as much as we would like to have, we could never earn. It's a free gift from God through our faith in Jesus Christ. By following Jesus to the cross, we find our path has been made straight. The sins that hinder us are forgiven. The nearsightedness that we have as fallen creatures has been, been remade into 2020 perfect spiritual vision. We are here this morning because we know that truth. That following Jesus leads you to your true home. And this home isn't going to be like any home that you've ever had. The home of the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth will be a place that's permanent. No need for any insurance when a disaster happens. No need to fix anything because everything will be perfect. And it'll be a home that will be full of joy. A place that won't ever need you to comfort one another for any reason. Because all that is scary, all that is wrong in this world will be gone and forgotten for good. It'll be a place of perfect paradise. That each of us will say, this was definitely worth the wait. And while we wait for that new home to come, and we recognize that we're still in exile, we take heed of those opening words of Isaiah. Comfort, comfort my people. No matter how scary life might get, no matter how many monsters are under your bed, or how lost you might be sometimes, or how often you have to deal with death, because of Jesus, you always have words of comfort that you can speak to others. And words of comfort that can be spoken to you. Knowing that there's a perfect forever home for you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We continue our worship with our prayers. Please stand. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Restore us, O God, and let your face shine, that we may be saved. As you led Joseph like a flock, so now by your Son lead us into straight paths. Bring us out of the bondage of our sins and plant us securely in your eternal promises. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God. In your blessed patience, you send your prophets and apostles, pastors and teachers in all times, that sinners would not perish, but rather reach repentance and find comfort in your word, which alone will stand forever. Preserve the servants of your church. Give to our congregation and all congregations an increase of hope, that we may await the revealing of the new heavens and new earth in lives of holiness and godliness, diligent to be found without spot or blemish and at peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, preserve your gift of marriage against the ravages of sin, the schemes of the devil, and the raging of the world. Bless the couples and families of our congregation. Strengthen them in love and care for one another, and establish them on the foundation of your word. 
Be also with those who are single, that they may find joy in service to you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of all comfort, your word alone endures forever. The nations of the world come and go before you. Even kings and rulers are like grass before your breath. Preserve us from placing our trust in princes and mortal men. Give us leaders who will rule after your good pleasure, keeping order and protecting life, that we may live in godly quietness and honesty. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, graciously regard all for whom we pray, especially Marcy, Crystal, Myra, Larry, Al, Marilyn, Helen, Karen, Ellen, Jerry, John, Bridge, Joel, Angela, and Dawn. Give healing to the sick. Give peace and comfort to the dying, including Cheryl, and bring an end to the pandemic. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you once prepared the way of your only begotten Son through the preaching and baptism of John. Prepare now your baptized Christians with true repentance and faith that seeks the forgiveness of sins. May Trinity Lutheran School be a beacon of your truth to the families of our church and community. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Into your hands, Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. and salutary that we should all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and calling sinners to repentance, that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood, the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
We continue with the Nunc Dimittis. Please stand. <laughs> We give thanks to Almighty God that you refresh us this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Lord, lift up his confidence upon you and give you peace. And we remain standing for our closing hymn 643, sent forth by God's blessings.
morning as we gather around God's Word and God's sacrament, a, a few announcements. Number one, it's the first Sunday of the month, so it's birthday Sunday. So who here has an exciting birthday in December? Stand up nice and tall. I know Beth does. And Beth, what day is your birth? Who do you share a birthday with? Aaron Rodgers, yeah, so, uh, no, 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 hold on, if you have a birthday in December, you're going to want to stand up, because not only is Aaron Rodgers' birthday in December, so is Christian Yelich and Giannis's, okay, so it is an MVP month, but it looks like Beth's the only one, so we're actually going to sing to Beth, all right, happy birthday to you, happy birthday. God's blessings to you this week. 